Hi, this is our third uh, look at fluids, and we're going to look at fluid dynamics today. So we have three goals. So fluid dynamics is all about flowing fluids. And as usual, we're going to make some idealizing assumptions here. So we're going to use a bit of an idealized system. We'll look at two equations, and the first of these is called the continuity equation. And the second is known as Bernoulli's principle. And Bernoulli's principle comes from applying energy conservation to fluids. Okay, so here we have a pipe, and it's got a constriction in the middle. It's narrower in the middle than at the ends. And maybe we have some water or something flowing through this pipe, some fluid flowing through the pipe, and those blue lines are what we call streamlines. So we're going to do some idealizations here make some simplifying assumptions and there are four of these in fact so there's quite a few so firstly we're going to assume that the flow is much like shown in the picture what we call a streamline flow and there's really no what we call turbulence so it's very smooth flow and if you come back in five seconds and take a picture of the flow it looks exactly the same as it does now okay Whereas in a turbulent system, it would look different at different times. Secondly, get a fancy word here, the fluid is incompressible. In other words, you cannot compress it any more than it already is. Okay, so basically this means it has a constant density. Thirdly, we're going to have no resistive forces between the fluid and the walls of the uh, container that is flowing through the walls of the pipe. And so our fancy word here is no viscosity. Okay, so it's not uh, like honey, for instance. Honey, if it, you try and flow that through a pipe, it's very sticky, kind of sticks to the walls a lot. So we're not talking about flowing honey here, we're more talking about flowing water. Uh, flow without resistance at all. And finally, this is a lot like number one actually. So we get some fancy words here. Streamlined, incompressible, viscosity, and irrotational. So that means it doesn't swirl around like crazy. Um, so you don't get these eddies you often see in, say, streams. Okay, so those are our simplifying assumptions. So pretty uh, straightforward, simple flow patterns with no resistance and constant density. Okay, lots of simplifying assumptions, but um, we'll see what we can, uh, how far we can take that. Okay, so our first equation we're going to use, there are two equations we generally apply to flowing fluids, and one is the continuity equation, so this is the first. And so we've got our same picture of the streamline flow happening, but we've put some, a uh, couple of areas here. And you note that the one on the left is uh, thin, but wide, and the one on the right, which is in the middle of the constricted area, the smaller area, uh, it does have a smaller area, but it's got uh, the same volume as the first one, which is why it's much longer. So these are two regions of uh, the fluid which have exactly the same volume. Okay, so we have a fancy term, term called the mass flow rate. So we imagine going past or through uh, the first pink disc here in our picture, disc one, we've got a certain mass that flows th through there in a certain amount of time. Okay. Now, because the fluid is not compressible, incompressible, the same mass must flow through the other part of the, the pink region, the second region, in that same time interval because they have the same volume. Okay, So you have a constant flow rate, mass flow rate, at every point in the fluid. And if your flow rates were different, then you'd be building up fluid at some points, or you'd be uh, losing it from other points. Okay, so as the flow happens, you have a constant mass flow rate. So the mass flow rate is the, uh, the amount of mass that passes by in a certain time interval. And mass we can write in terms of density and volume. So there we've got mass flow rate is density times some volume over some time interval, and a volume we can write as an area times, say, uh, a thickness, a length. Okay, so here we have some terms, finally, A and delta X, which apply to our, uh, our picture below. 
Okay, so the mass flow rate, and remember here we have delta x over delta t. Well, of course, delta x over delta t is the speed at which the, uh, the fluid is flowing at that point. Okay, so we have rho AB. So the mass flow rate is constant, which means we can say at any point in the fluid, point 1, the flow rate has to match that at any other point in the fluid, such as point 2. So in this case, density at 1 times area at 1 times speed at 1 is density at 2 times speed at 2, times area at 2 times speed at 2. And of course, the density is constant. That was one of our assumptions. The fluid is incompressible, which means constant density. So we can cancel out the factors of density and boil our equation down to this. Area times speed at one place is equal to the area times the speed at some other place, any other place in the flowing fluid, as long as your pipe doesn't leak or you're not adding fluid at any other point. Okay, so this is what we call the continuity equation. And the bottom line here is simply that if you have a low area section, then the fluid's going to flow faster. And if you widen it out, the fluid slows down. And you've probably seen this in, say, uh, streams. If you make a constricted area in the stream, then you're going to have faster flow there. Or, let's say you take a garden hose and you put your thumb on the end of the opening of the garden hose and you can really get the fluid to come out much, much faster uh, if you make a small opening in the garden hose. Okay, so you've probably seen that in uh, in person. But basically, here's the, th the thing at the bottom of the screen here. The fluid flows faster in narrow sections of the tube. That's what continuity is all about. So area times speed is a constant for all points in the tube. Okay, so a really nice fluid system is uh, the blood flow in our own bodies. So um, what we have here is we can apply continuity to our circulatory system and there's all sorts of, of changes in area inside the um, that system. So we've got large veins and arteries and we have some incredibly tiny capillaries and you have to have uh, continuity applying all the way around the system. So our body in terms of blood flow is a nice example of uh, a fluid system. You can't make all the simplifying assumptions that we made at the beginning here of this uh, video, but uh, you can still apply fluid ideas to the to the human body. Okay, so let me ask you this. So we have three points now marked in our uh, streamlined flow inside this tube. Okay, and the flow is going from left to right here. So we've got a line that goes straight down the center of the pipe, and three points are marked, one, two, and three. And continuity says that because the area at point 1 is the same as the area at point 3, then the flow speed is the same. And again, we're ignoring any resistive effects, uh, interactions between the walls and the fluid itself. And at point 2, because it's narrower there, smaller area there, then the speed is going to be greater at point 2 compared to point 1 or point 3. So where do you think the fluid pressure is the largest at point 1, point 2, or point 3. And I've got three possible answers for, for you, really, at uh, point 2. Now, point 1 and point 3 are really equivalent points, so um, that's why answer 2 is at points 1 and 3. Or the pressure is the same at all points. For instance, they have the same uh, uh, vertical position. So maybe that's um, going to tell you the pressure is the same. Okay, so let's analyze that a little bit. And what we're going to do here is we're going to look at kind of a simulation of fluid flowing through the pipe, through a pipe. Okay, and what you see is that fluid speeds up, going from the wide region to the narrow one, and then it slows down again, going from the narrow out to the wide again. So we have a force being applied like this to the fluid. So the for there has to be a net force making it, it pick up speed going left to right from the left end to the middle. And then there's a force going to the left on the fluid as it comes out of the narrow region and slows down as it comes to the wider region at the right. Okay, So where do you get forces from inside of fluids? Well, it comes from pressure times area kind of ideas. 
So we can see that to get a net force from left to right at the left edge of the, of the tube, we've got to have high pressure at the left and low pressure in the middle. And then correspondingly, we have to get this force to the right on the right-hand side of the picture. Again, we have to have a high pressure region on the right side and a low pressure region in the, uh, in the middle. Okay, so that's in fact what the pressure has to do in order to give us the forces we need to get the correct accelerations. As the water travels from the left part to the middle, there's a net force to the, to the right, which speeds things up. And as it goes from the middle to the right, there's a force to the left, which acts to slow things down. This has got to come from these pressures high at the, at the large area parts and lower in the middle, where the area is smallest. And this is actually consistent with what's called Bernoulli's Principle. So we'll look at Bernoulli's Principle a little bit here. And Bernoulli's Principle just comes from applying energy conservation to the fluid. So we'll start with our standard five-term energy equation. Okay, And we're going to consider point 0.1 and point 0.2 here. And so in general, and we'll, we'll make it as general as we can, so in our picture, 0.1 and 0.2 are at the same y value, but um, we'll apply the equation as generally as we can and just put in y1 for the vertical position of 0.1 and y2 for the vertical position of um, 0.2. Okay, so we've got our standard uh, gravitational potential energy terms, our standard kinetic energy terms. Then we get some work being done on the fluid as it flows. So we'll expand that work term a little bit. So work we can write as force times distance. So as the fluid in area one flows from left to right, well, there's a work being done on it, and there's a force uh, from the left to the right. So we're imagining the whole bit of fluid from the pink, between the pink region on the uh, left to the pink region on the right, including all that fluid in between the pink regions, okay? So work is being done externally from forces acting external to that bit of fluid, that section of fluid, on the front face, the left face of the area one, and on the right face of area two. Okay? And as the fluid moves through delta x1, well, then there's work being done because there's a pressure times an area. So we can write F1 delta x1 is P1A1 times delta x1. And these works are in the opposite directions Okay, because the uh, on area one, the force is coming from the left, so the displacement is to the right. The force is going from left to right, pressure times area force, so that's a positive work term. And then in region two, the displacement of the fluid is to the right, but the pressure times area force is acting on the right-hand side of that volume and is directed in the left, to, toward the left. So that's a negative work, so that's why the signs are such as they are. Okay, so we can uh, throw that into the work. So we expand our work into two different terms. Pressure, area, delta x at each place, one plus, one minus. Okay, so then we get a more complicated version of the uh, energy equation. And now what we're gonna do is we'll try and simplify this a little bit. We recognize that area times delta x is just a volume, and area two times delta x two is exactly the same volume as area one times delta x one. Okay, so we're going to just divide by volume. And the mass we're talking about is the mass in uh, one of these regions. So mass divided by volume is just density. So we can replace all our m's by densities. And area times delta x1 is a volume, so we're dividing by that volume. So that just eliminates a delta x from the equation. So we get a slightly simpler uh, looking equation at least. Get six terms instead of our usual five, but that's not too bad. And now, because we've divided by, by volume, our units are actually joules per cubic meter. Each term has units of joules per cubic meter, so it's actually energy density units here, energy per cubic volume. But don't worry too much about that. And this is what we call Bernoulli's principle or Bernoulli's equation. And we will apply Bernoulli's equation just like we did with our standard five-term energy equation. And so what we do is we simply write it down 
and then we start throwing away as many terms as we possibly can. Okay, and we'll do some examples of that in class and uh, and on the assignments. Okay, but one thing to notice is that uh, this is consistent with our conclusion about pressure. So in the pipe we were looking at, y1 and y2 were the same. So those terms, the first term on the left and the first term on the right, can cancel out. And then we've got 1 half rho v1 squared plus p1 equals 1 half rho v2 squared plus p2. Okay, in our case, point 0.1, the speed was slower than at point 0.2. So if the speed is bigger at point 0.2, then the pressure at point 0.2 has to be less than that at point 0.1 to make the equation work out. Okay, so that is all for our introduction to fluids. So don't forget, you can apply two equations, continuity and Bernoulli, and together they can get you a long way in terms of analyzing an idealized system of flowing fluids. Okay, that's all for today.